Well, it was mentioned earlier that this is a family service, and our kids have a special uh, thing to do while I'm preaching. And uh, there's 30 packets, I think, for kids. And they're going to be doing some special coloring and uh, doing a puzzle as well during my message. They may not hear a thing I say, but they're going get to get a lot out of this. So uh, that's exciting. So are you going to hand those out? You need to come to the front to get them, and Haley's right there, and she's got your packet. So why don't you come? And uh, we want you to follow along the message. And uh, I think you're going to get lots out of this this evening. Well, we're continuing our series on back to Acts 2. We're looking back at what the early congregation in Jerusalem was like. And sometimes in order to move forward, you have to go backwards to remind yourself of the basics and the foundations of our faith. Otherwise, if we just go forward without going backwards sometimes, we might find ourselves going off on a misguided tangent and even go into serious error. And so we're going to go back to Acts 2. Over the past several weeks, we looked at how those first disciples in Jerusalem were filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And we saw that through the power of the Holy Spirit that came that day, Peter stood up as the apostle and he preached a sermon in which over 3,000 or about 3,000 people were added to the number of believers in Jerusalem. Now immediately following that great outpouring of the Spirit and a great first fruits in gathering of souls, what did those young believers do? It says in verse 42, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. But that's not all. Let's continue to see other ways in which the apostles lived back in those days. So beginning at verse 46. So continuing, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Tonight our focus is just on the first part of verse 46 where it says, continuing continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Here we see a major aspect of the life of those early believers in Jerusalem. They frequently assembled together in the temple. It's actually quite amazing that the disciples gathered in the temple. Think about it. The religious leaders who who were in charge of this temple were the same people who only weeks before had persecuted Yeshua on several occasions involved in plots to kill him, you would think that the disciples would want to stay clear of the temple if they knew what was best for them. But they continued to go to the temple anyway. It's also amazing that they gathered at the temple when Yeshua himself had prophesied that the temple was about to be destroyed. He said this to his disciples in Matthew 24, 2. Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. It's also amazing that they gathered in the temple when the veil of the temple had been ripped in two the moment that Yeshua died on the cross. Surely that indicated that the temple sacrificial system was now obsolete. That Yeshua's sacrifice of himself on the cross was the once and for all final atonement for sins and that there's no more need for the temple and the sacrifices. In light of all of this, why would the apostles continue to go to the temple even on a daily basis? I don't have all the answers to this question, but let me give you a few answers that I think may explain this. The disciples continued to go to the temple because they continued to identify themselves as part and parcel of the Jewish race and part of the covenant people of Israel. 
Those first disciples did not see themselves as having joined a new religion called Christianity. But they continued to see themselves as Jews and holding to the Jewish faith as revealed in the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. Those first Jewish believers understood that the only difference between them and the other Jews is that they had met the long-awaited Messiah that was prophesied by the prophets and that they were convinced that he had saved them from their sins and that they owed their lives to him and that his name was Yeshua. In their minds, what could be more Jewish than following the Jewish Messiah? They didn't see themselves as a separate and new movement, but the ultimate reform movement within Judaism. It's interesting to note that it was the custom of Yeshua himself and his apostles to to attend services at the temple in Jerusalem or at a synagogue whenever they were away from Jerusalem. So we see that the disciples met in the temple because they continued to identify themselves as part of the Jewish race and as part of the people of Israel. The second reason why the disciples continued to meet in the temple was because they, that's where genuine seekers gathered and therefore those people were good soil in which to sow the good news. The disciples were ter- determined to let their light shine before men. And what better people to shine their light upon than those who were genuine seekers after God. The for- first recorded act of the apostles after the day of Pentecost was Peter and John's trip to the temple at the afternoon hour of prayer. We read about that in Acts chapter 3. But they were not only on the way to a prayer meeting... They ended up doing an evangelistic outreach as a result of a lame man's miraculous healing that led to the preaching of the gospel. Later in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, we read, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. It seems that evangelism was even effective at the temple in Jerusalem. Those first disciples who once hid in fear after Yeshua's departure were now emboldened by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel even in this most public place in Jerusalem. I'm so thrilled that the Lord gave us this amazing opportunity to build a place of worship right here in the heart of Jerusalem in a shopping mall of all places, in a public place. Instead of hiding on some back alley, we're right in the middle of the city, right on Jaffa Road. Now, a third reason why they continued to go to the temple was a practical reason. The temple courts surrounding the temple building itself were very large areas that could handle thousands of people. Remember, on just one day, 3,000 new believers had joined their number, and we're told later in Acts chapter 2 that the Lord added daily those who were being saved. They needed a, a massive... Um, place to gather in order for all of these new believers to join together. Some scholars actually believe that the original 120 disciples who waited for the outpouring of of the Spirit were actually gathered not in someone's house, but in one of the 30 spacious rooms around the temple court, described by Josephus and called oikoi in Greek or houses. Now, I believe that it's important to meet in small groups. In fact, We promote our small group ministry, small groups in homes, small groups even here at community night. But I don't believe, frankly, in house churches, if that means that believers should only meet in houses. There are people who see smallness as a virtue and that anything that is big is bad. They would see a congregation of over 100 people as too big. I guess as soon as you get numbers that high, then you've got no more room in the house. And so sometimes one is even discouraged from going out and evangelizing because we've already got enough people. But if we're really going to be biblical, we need to gather in small groups in our homes, but also gather as a larger group in public places. Now what happens in large temple-style gatherings that we can't achieve to the same degree in small groups or in homes? While gathering as a small group expresses the truth that we are the family of God, 
Gathering as a large group of believers expresses the truth that we are not just individuals separate from one another, but we are part of a holy nation and the people of God. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. It's when we gather in the hundreds on a Sunday evening that we have a real sense that we're not just separate individuals or separate family units, but we are part of a holy nation. And when an assembly of a large group of believers in the land is called to pray together in one place, like we've gathered many times in the pavilion for a citywide or nationwide prayer gathering, we are reminded that we are fighting a spiritual battle not alone, but we are part of the victorious army of God. Another thing that's hard to achieve in a smaller gathering, but we can achieve in large temple-style gatherings, is expressing our oneness as a people. It's wonderful to gather as a large group to remind ourselves that we're a holy nation, but we also need to be reminded that we're not a nation divided, but a one holy nation under God. Remember what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple. With one accord is just one word in the original language. It means un unanimously or with one mind. The word continuing comes from the Greek word that means to be earnest toward or to adhere closely to. So when those first disciples gathered with other believers at the temple, they came together in earnest to strengthen the unity of the body. Now there are believers today who show up maybe once or twice a month to a large worship celebration and think they're doing pretty good. And when they do come, they do more watching than worshiping. In essence, they come to get entertained. But when we gather together, we're doing more than that. We're expressing our oneness as the body of Messiah, and as the nation of God. There are believers who sometimes come and they spend more time analyzing and criticizing than they do worshiping. By sitting in judgment, they are expressing not the unity of the body, where every organ of the body should play a part, but the disunity of the body. And by their lack of participation, either by staying home or coming only to passively watch a show, they are promoting disunity and causing the body to be dysfunctional. Because not all the parts of the body are fully engaged in an act of worship and celebration. Speaking of our oneness, it's interesting that we live in an increasing age of specialization. We have specialists for everything. We've got a heart specialist You've got a marketing specialist. You've got a fitness specialist. You've got children's doctors and you've got old age care workers. You can now go on the internet today and spend most of your free hours interacting with a community of people whose whole lives around, revolve around skateboarding. Increasingly, this fragmentation of society into micro communities ends up getting reflected in the body of Messiah in the church itself. Now I see the importance and value of having children's ministry specialists and youth ministry specialists and specialists for seniors ministry and young adults. And I see the importance of having those with a burden for intercessory prayer having their own meetings. And that goes for men's gatherings and women's gatherings and Hebrew speaking meetings and other language oriented gatherings. But there's a time when all of us no matter how old we are or what our interests are or what our mother tongue is, need to come together as one body to express the fact that we are in one accord. We are one people. Many congregations now never have their children or teenagers gathering with the adults in any part of the main worship services. They have their own church, sometimes in a building next door or downstairs or upstairs or some other appendage to the building. The children are doing an exercise right now where it says, you are a big piece of the puzzle. Put names of people of King of Kings in each of the puzzle pieces. Try cutting the puzzle apart and putting it back together. See if you can make all of the pieces fit. That's a good exercise. We are all pieces of one whole picture. 
And when one piece is missing, that picture is not complete. An army has various specialized units, but they cannot just do their own thing without coordination with the rest of the army. And while God established tribes, He never intended them to become separate nations. All 12 tribes were meant to stay connected with the whole house of Jacob, the house of Israel. Paul warns against divisions where one group says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Jesus. And Paul reserves one of his harshest rebukes for the divisive person to the point that we are not allowed even to have table fellowship with a person who is divisive. And while God allows for separate congregations in one city, the emphasis always of Paul when he writes his letters letters is he writes to the church at Ephesus or the church at Corinth or the church at Thessalonica. That's one of the chief reasons why the Lord called us to build this place, the pavilion, so that we could have a place large enough for citywide gatherings where representatives from all of the congregations can gather and express our oneness as the body of Messiah. Now, doctrine is important. The fundamentals of the faith are essential. And we cannot sacrifice truth on the altar of unity. But as one person said, and some have attributed this to Augustine, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. Individual congregations can become self-contained, even self-righteous, and come to see themselves as the only true remnant of true believers. You know, us four and no more. But Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 says that the remnant that makes it through the narrow gate is not so small a number of people after all. It says, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What a massive number of people will make it into the kingdom and enjoy eternal life with the King of Kings. A multitude which no man could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues just standing before the throne. Hallelujah. We need to express that oneness. We need to express the fact that the body of Messiah is wider than just our own little circle of friends. Another thing that is hard to achieve in smaller groups but we can achieve in temple-style gatherings is celebration. Whenever it was time to celebrate the Feast of Passover, Shavuot, Tabernacles, the people were commanded to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate together at the temple. To celebrate with throngs of people from all over the land of Israel and even from the nations. And I love gathering every year at Shavuot. Here in this place at Ramat Rachel. I love gathering at the Feast of Tabernacles at the International Conference Center, also at Ramat Rachel, and some of the events now happening here. The greater the number gathered, the greater the celebration, it seems. And you know, we often feel alone in our battle against the flesh and against the devil. We also need to come together to celebrate our victories in a big way. This week at Community Night, this Wednesday, we're going to gather, have a meal together, and then we're going to worship the Lord, and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to share testimonies of what God's been doing recently in our lives. We need to tell our stories. We need to celebrate. We need to gather together and sing and dance before the Lord in celebration. In conclusion, I simply want to make this note. It says in Acts 2.46, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Now, I don't believe that every day every believer was at the temple. Otherwise, I can't imagine how they could make a living or raise their families. But I'm convinced that every day there was a good representation of believers gathered at the temple to pray and to worship and to share the good news. Luke used the word daily here in the book of Acts to emphasize the fact that we need to gather more than just once a week. We need to frequently gather together 
as the people of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I want to encourage you to be a people that celebrates with the people of God, that gathers frequently, that does not forsake the assembling of yourselves together with other believers. We need each other. Each one of us is a piece of the puzzle that cannot go missing. We need you. You even need me. We need each other. And I believe that God is calling us to gather like this in this large place frequently that we might celebrate the goodness of God. And I want us to also recognize that the body of Messiah is far more than our little congregation. We're part of a great army of God that he is building in these latter days. We are one body in Jerusalem and we must celebrate our oneness and we must celebrate that he alone makes us one. It's our faith in Him. It's our trust in Him. It's in His truth that we are brought under this wonderful canopy of God's love and God's grace. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Lord, thank You for this gathering this evening. I pray, O oh God, that this will be a gathering that makes a difference in our lives. And I know, Lord, that wherever you're present, you, you're there to touch our lives. You're not in this place sitting back passively watching, but you're involved. And your desire, Lord, is that we reach up and touch you. That we look to you for our help and our strength and to meet our needs. And Lord, we just thank you that you are here. We thank you, Lord, that you do meet us as we gather together in your name. We thank you, Lord, that we are one in you. And pray, O oh God, that we will continue to celebrate our oneness, that we will earnestly gather together as one body. May we not become lax, especially in these last days when there are so many temptations that would draw us away from you. In these latter days when so much false teaching, and so much confusion comes. May we be found in the house of God, celebrating together, learning together, walking together, encouraging one another while it is still day. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen.